Tonight we have something very special for you. Let's get started with this. Long lines formed outside the University of Toronto's Art Museum this past winter to see an exhibit three years in the making. Artist Kent Monkman served both as curator and artist for an exhibition that takes us through 150 years of Canadian history from an Indigenous perspective. Sometimes ironic, but mostly poignant and tragic, Kent Monkman's vision unfolds over nine chapters from the period of New France to today, with each chapter prompting the viewer to reflect on the cost of the last 150 plus years and to consider the price that was paid and is still being paid by Indigenous peoples. And with that, let me welcome to our studio Kent Monkman. It's really nice to meet you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So in uh, 2014, you were approached by U of T to do something for Canada 150. Uh, Why did you take them up on the offer? Well, it was an opportunity to um, make a statement about what the last 150 years mean to Indigenous people. And uh, Barbara Fisher, who knew my work and had you know, known that I, I do museum-based projects, uh, created an opportunity for me to go into a number of institutions across the country and look at museum collections. So that was really uh, a strong impetus for me to, to get involved with this project because I, I love doing uh, museum-based projects. Mm -hmm. And um, so I spent a year basically, you know, traveling around the country to look at objects to find inspiration for this exhibition. And what did you want the viewer to take away from the exhibit? Well, I wanted Canadians to really reflect on what the last 150 years have meant to Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. The last 150 years have probably been the worst uh, in terms of Indigenous relations with um, European settler cultures because the, this was really the beginning of the colonial policies. Mm -hmm. You know, after Confederation, and we, you, know, you see the signing of the treaties, uh, the incarceration of Indigenous people on, on reserves. Um, and then, you know, the legacy of incarceration moving all the way up into the present with, you know, disproportionate numbers of Indigenous people you know, filling our prisons and penitentiaries. Um, and the institutionalization of Indigenous people on, on, on many levels, you know, in residential schools, uh, so many Indigenous people sick and ailing and filling our hospitals. Um, so really, I wanted, I, I really want Canadians to think hard about, about you know, what the experience has meant to uh, the last 150 years have meant to Indigenous people mm -hmm. and um, to, 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 to educate themselves um, specifically. And I mean, here's the, the TRC report is now available. I mean, mm -hmm. Every Canadian should be reading that. And some Indigenous artists declined to participate in Canada 150. Why was it important for you? This is an opportunity to take a critical perspective and I think our voices need to be heard. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this was an opportunity to um, educate people. This is an opportunity to create art that could move people, create awareness, mm -hmm. um, inform. Um, being silent is not, not a, uh, you know, or stepping out was not really an option for me. I felt this was actually a very important moment um, to take some of the spotlight and mm -hmm. to address you know, many of these issues and many of these histories that have largely uh, been kept quiet, specifically residential schools. Why haven't Canadians learned about residential schools um, in our schools? You know, mm -hmm. it's just entering school curriculum now. So this was, you know, it's very important for me to, to, to have a, a voice and have, make a strong statement about what the last 150 years have meant. And to engage with Canada 150 doesn't mean I'm celebrating Canada. It means I'm mm -hmm. um, entering the dialogue to encourage people to think differently about Canada. Um, I want to take a look at a painting that uh, you say has, has influenced you. It's, uh, f you saw this painting six years ago, and it's from 1988. What effect, the, uh, sorry, 1888, um, what effect did this painting have on you when you saw it? So I stumbled across these Spanish history, this is one of several Spanish history paintings that I, I discovered at the Prado. I'd never been to the Prado before, and you know, I've been making um, paintings um, with historical subject matter, looking at the paintings of the 19th century made here in North America by European settler artists, but of course I've seen many history paintings before, but when mm -hmm. I saw that painting, um, it really moved me because it, uh, uh, I knew that painting still had the potential to move people emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that painting still had the possibility to hold a narrative, um, to engage all the formal aspects of painting that had been kind of you know, broken down by the modernists in, in, into reductive vocabularies, but to harness all of, all of these um, vocabularies of painting and to channel them to serve a larger purpose, which is to 
um, you know, tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I really was taken, taken by that painting because it, it was very strongly emotional. It was about a, a specific uh, moment in history. Um, it was so beautifully painted, you know, the expression on the men's faces, the composition was very sort of quiet. The painter's hand actually had kind of, um, uh, he'd submerged his own hand into the painting, meaning it, the brush stroke was sort of serving the larger purpose. It wasn't sort of taking over. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, you know, painting had become, has become um, a medium that, um, you know, through that process of, of deconstructing it, the modernist kind of, um, in, a, in a way, reduced its, its power. So I wanted to go back to history painting because I felt like, um, you know, the, the histories that have been painted about North America have largely excluded mm -hmm. the real histories of indigenous people here. And I wanted to authorize into art history um, these very important events that happen to indigenous people. We're missing. That are missing from the, the canon of art history. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that what, that's five, fast forward five years later, here was this opportunity to do this kind of project with the University of Toronto. So uh, I really wanted this exhibition to sort of rely heavily on my painting practice so that I could make history paintings that really addressed, you know, specifically the last 150 years here. And you said something to the effect of like, so if people in the future can actually look at them and then see the history that was... Well, that's, that was, I think that was part of what made that experience of seeing that painting so profound was time just collapsed. Mm -hmm. And there I was, you know, in that, in that moment. And I felt that um, the artist had achieved something by, you know, basically time traveling with his, with his painting 150 years into the future where I was completely moved by what, what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I wanted to be able to create paintings that would enter art history and, and, and educate and, and move people, you know, not just in the present, but 150 years from now. And I feel like that language of painting has the ability to mm -hmm. transcend time um, because it's not trendy, it, uh, it's classic mm -hmm. and it, it will endure. Well, we've been talking about your paintings. Uh, let's take a look at some of your work. Um, this is the daddies. What are you trying to convey with the daddies? So uh, I was already familiar with this Fathers of Confederation painting, and I'm sure a lot of Canadians are. I mean, it's sort of the uh, iconic image of the, the you know, Confederation, mm -hmm. um, the signing of you know, Confederation with all the Fathers of Confederation there. And, uh, but it excludes indigenous people and, and you know, the signing, the carving up of Canada into, into parcels of land, to provinces. I mean, had, there were no indigenous voices present at that table. So when I looked at the composition, you know, I noticed that uh, there was a little footstool in the foreground that, mm -hmm. that was empty or vacant. And I thought that would be the perfect place to, to perch my alter ego mischief in, in this uh, sort of intervention, you know, where she represents an indigenous point of view. And, you know, I decided to paint her nude in sort of the most um, kind of in-your-face uh, posed, mm -hmm. you know, directing, uh, directing her, 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 her look towards the, these fathers of confederation. Um, it was really to um, get people to think, you know, about including indigenous people when they think about this country. Well, in that painting, they're all looking at her. Mm -hmm. What are they thinking? <laughs> Well, you know, some of them have a kind of uh, a surprised look on their face. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't like to, I, I wouldn't like to say this is what they're thinking because I think that's for the, the you know, the audience, the viewer to interpret, mm -hmm. um, you know, the painting themselves. But, uh, you know, they can fill, in, fill that in with their own imagination. Um, let's take a look at another of your paintings. This one's called The Scream. What is happening here? So one of the chapters um, in this exhibition, I wanted to uh, reflect on uh, residential schools, the impact of residential schools, um, and the 60s scoop. And for me, at the core of these two uh, things w was the removal of children. So that's what I decided to focus on, uh, was the, act, the physical act of the children, um, you know, that moment when the Mounties and the priests and the nuns would come to the reserve and, and take the kids away for, you know, for the residential schools. Um, and you know, in the TRC, it describes exactly the scene that I painted, which is, uh, you know, um, sometimes violent um, removal of the children, um, very emotionally upsetting, of course, to the parents and the families. And so, this is something that I wanted to uh, I wanted to approach that subject uh, as honestly as I could as a painter, 
And I felt like um, I'd finally had the skills to, to tackle something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, even five years earlier, when I stood at in the Prado, I was wondering, you know, do I have the skills to sort of tackle this subject matter and give it the importance and the weight and the emotional value that it's that it warrants? And um, so I, you know, over over the course of the last few years, I, I felt like my my art practice, I was able to bring my art practice up to that level and and really give that. Um, that painting and that scene, the, the value and the importance and the gravitas that it requires. And why call it the scream? Well, um, you know, there's a mother who's, who's screaming in, in the painting. Um, it, uh, I wanted a strong emotional title for the, for the piece, but, you know, because it's a painting, it's obviously silent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking, of course, of Edward Munch's painting, The Scream, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, he deliberately avoided telling people what that painting was about. Um, whereas, you know, my painting, it's very specific as to what this uh, painting is about. And uh, I felt like that was sort of counter to Edward Munch's intention with his, with his work, but I felt that it really needed to be a strong statement. And we should mention that TRC is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, here's one entitled, The Death of the Virgin After Caravaggio. Take us through this one. So again, you know, I draw a lot of inspiration from classical paintings. Mm -hmm. I love Caravaggio's paintings. There's, a, you know, the element of realism in them, which was very important for me. Um, this body of work also was a, a signaled a, a bit of a shift in my own art practice in that we started to shoot, uh, you know, photograph real models, real people. I wanted, uh, I didn't want these people look to, to look like generic people. I wanted them to really feel like human beings, uh, and real indigenous people with real lives. Mm -hmm. And so we photographed these people. I, I did sketches first based on Caravaggio's painting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I saw that painting and I saw the, the, the virgin, you know, lying in, in the bed, I immediately thought of missing and murdered women. I thought of, you know, teen suicide. So this, for me, this painting was, I was able to kind of bridge a number of different themes in the exhibition and um, talk about sickness and healing as well. Um, indigenous medicine versus Western medicine. Um, so in that one painting, I felt like uh, it, 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 I was able to really kind of approach a number of different themes. You've mentioned her before, and we've seen her, uh, Miss Chief, and she features prominently in your work. Um, who is she? Well, I created Miss Chief a number of years ago, uh, probably 2004. I, I was looking at the work of uh, these European settler artists, 19th century artists like George Catlin, and I noticed that he specifically and a couple of others were making paintings of themselves in their work. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to challenge their work. I wanted to challenge the subjectivity of their work. So I decided by creating an alter ego that could appear to live in that period where she was painting herself in the work, um, that would be an effective way to engage with um, the dynamic of artist and model. Um, the subjectivity of, you know, someone lensing another culture through their own eyes and through their minds and creating art with it. So that was what I, that, so by creating this alter ego, artistic alter ego, mm -hmm. I was able to reverse the gaze and have an indigenous artist persona looking mm -hmm. at European uh, cultures. And um, I also wanted a character that, that could represent um, indigenous uh, sexuality and gender mm -hmm. uh, roles, which of course differ, you know, than uh, European binary of male, female. Um, indigenous people uh, had a place for the third gender, uh, men who could live as women, women who could live as men. And uh, the contemporary term is two-spirited, but mm -hmm. it really means people of, of uh, different sexualities or people who live in the other gender. And um, so Mischief really presents a, an empowered, um, She's an empowered representation of, of decolonized sexuality. What would you like um, for an indigenous child or youth to know about two-spirited people, especially if they're struggling with that? Well, I think, you know, the main message is that it's okay to mm -hmm. be who you are and this, that this existed in our traditional cultures. You know, uh, with the influence of Christianity, um, indigenous people lost their acceptance of these different sexualities and um, different gender roles. So I think mm -hmm. that um, it's important for Indigenous people and everyone to really to understand that Indigenous people uh, had a respect and a, and a place for, for two-spirited people. 
You've referred to Miss Chief as uh, being a trickster. Mm -hmm. How so? Well, she's a trickster in that she kind of rampages through art history, up, mm -hmm. upending the, the tables and, uh, of power and the dynamics of power. And because she is an art, artistic persona, um, she's changing the narratives. Mm -hmm. you know, so all of those conventional paintings that we've, you know, people are so used to seeing in museums, you know, I, what I've done is I've appropriated back those landscapes and I've changed the narratives inside those paintings mm -hmm. so that um, you know, people will, will think about history differently and they'll think about all these received uh, uh, histories from, uh, from the history books and, and, and uh, you know, hopefully consider uh, an Indigenous perspective. Um, painting Miss Chief, performing as Miss Chief, um, what does it offer you personally? Being Miss Chief is very liberating. I, I, I think she can be really flamboyant, she can be really sassy, she can be really... Um, you know, she's a trickster, mm -hmm. so it's having having another persona to kind of act out um, has been really fun. Um, you know, there's a side of me that's, you know, the very serious artist, you know, who works very hard in my practice, and Miss Chief brings a lot of humor to the practice. She brings a lot of fun, um, but there's, a, you know, also the layers, the serious layers are there through all, through all of the work as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd never really considered myself as a performance artist before uh, I created this character. Mm -hmm. And then once she was brought to life, I realized there was so much um, potential to kind of um, speak. You can say and, and create art in a performance language that you can't on a painting. So it really has expanded my practice and my ability to communicate with people. You're from Winnipeg? Yeah. Um, you grew up in Winnipeg. How did you start to paint? How did you get into it? Well, I, I've been an artist my entire life. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I rec you know, my parents recognized it, my family recognized it. I had a mm -hmm. great grandmother who recognized it in me and encouraged it in me very early. Mm -hmm. Probably from the time I was four or five, I think I identified as being an artist. So uh, it was never really a question about whether I was going to be an artist. It was more a question of how. How does, how does a kid you know, from Winnipeg uh, pursue a, a career as a professional artist. And you know, there's many different paths, so it's all been about how do I find my own path and how do, how do I find my own place and create uh, my own um, mark? How, mm -hmm. do I, how do you distill a unique vision in, in, a, in a world of art making where there's so much? And you know, people always say, well, that's all been done before. Um, so that's really the challenge of, of any young artist is mm -hmm. how do you create a unique place for your for your own vision. Did you ever have any struggles of how do you create a unique um, position when you didn't see people that look like you from your background? I th yeah, I mean, I was always aware that, you know, uh, in, in museums and art galleries that there was a real lack of representation of, you know, who I was mm -hmm. and, and specifically Indigenous people. And um, so I think I, I was really interested in, in, in um, creating space inside uh, you know, museums and art galleries where indigenous people would recognize themselves. And I know that that's happened through a lot of my work. People can connect to it and not just indigenous people, but um, I really want the work to be accessible to a, a wide audience. And I think this is why, because I used to paint abstractly. Mm -hmm. and I came back to representational painting because I found that that language of painting is, is much more um, widely accessible. And for me, that's, I really wanted to speak to a wide audience. I would like to show you some more paintings of your work. Um, how do these paintings draw on your experiences in Winnipeg? Well, the Urban Res series, um, I, you know, I've been working with these sort of North American landscape paintings uh, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And um, all the while I was thinking, you know, even our cities are indigenous places at one point, were indigenous places, gathering places, trading places at one point. And Winnipeg has, you know, the highest per capita indigenous population in the country. I grew up there. So it's a city just full of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided to sort of take, you know, those similar narratives that I was painting in these sort of romantic landscapes and transpose them to an urban environment to, to make a point that indigenous people are still here, you know. We're, we're, uh, we're a very strong presence in urban centers across the country, specifically in the prairie cities, but, you know, like Winnipeg or Regina or Saskatoon, but um, it was a way just to sort of make the point, you know, Indigenous people are very alive and well, and the, the cultures are, are, are alive, even though Indigenous people live in the city, mm -hmm. um, there's a very strong cultural presence there. Uh, is that why they're uh, depicted as being abstract? 
Like why the abstract depiction of people? Well, so I, you know, through through this project and starting a couple of years ago, I started to work with um, idioms from modern painting. Mm -hmm. uh, again, um, you know, Canada is 150 years. Well, that 150 years pretty much runs concurrently with the period of modern art. So what the modernists did was they moved away from their own traditions. They kind of left, uh, discarded the, 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 the painting traditions, the social traditions, of their predecessors and you know European mo mo modernism was very much about just a kind of a cultural amnesia just of this big upheaval and moving forward and a lot of European settlers came to North America with this idea of North America being a blank slate you know start start fresh all those ideals of modernity which were about rejecting the past and you know forgetting your traditions were uh, when those were you know um, transferred to indigenous people, it had a devastating effect because indigenous people didn't want to lose their traditions, they didn't want to lose their, their land, they didn't want to lose their languages. Um, so I've, I've used these idioms from modern art to talk about how uh, this, this period of modernity has, has had a, you know, a damaging effect on indigenous people. And specific, so I use you know, this metaphor of the flattening of the pictorial plane, mm -hmm. and that's what you know, the modernists started to experiment with was the, you know, prior to the modernists, I mean, there was this illusion of three-dimensional space on a, on a canvas, right? Mm -hmm. So they started to flatten the pictorial space, and, um, and even when it comes to figuration, painting, you know, nudes, um, the human body, um, the cubis, you know, kind of, uh, P Picasso specifically, I've referenced Picasso a lot in my work, um, kind of deconstructed the female nude, and I, I, I use these, uh, female nudes from Picasso to talk about that almost a violent that's a metaphor for violence against female spirit because so those flat images are really jarring they're, they're very jarring yeah. in, in the context where you see a more representational or realistic rendering of mm -hmm. an environment the two-dimensional figures really feel very jarring and, and kind of violent so and that was the effect I was after uh, the subtitle to your exhibit is um, called the story of First Nations resilience why resilience well this uh, as this exhibition um, developed, you know, I realized that a lot of these chapters were pretty heavy and pretty dark. These are dark chapters in Canada's history. These are dark chapters in Indigenous history. And um, I didn't want that, I didn't want the heaviness of this exhibition to overwhelm. I really wanted to focus on the fact that Indigenous people have survived all of these things. And to really put the power back into Indigenous people for their ability to, to be resilient through so much. Um, so for me, this was really about honoring the resilience of Indigenous people. What does reconciliation look like to you? Reconciliation, um, <laughs> this is, uh, you know, reconciliation for me, it doesn't really mean anything until it actually comes with restitution. I think, you know, you can talk all you want, words are empty and meaningless, but, you know, re true reconciliation will start when there's restitution. And restitution means, uh, you know, real acts towards, um, uh, you know, indigenous sovereignty towards um, indigenous people um, um, not being wards of the Canadian state. In your brochure for the exhibit, you write, can this country begin to heal, reconcile, and offer restitution for the hundreds of thousands of shattered lives and damaged families? Can it? Well, I'm hopeful. I wouldn't be um, messaging uh, about this if I, if I wasn't hopeful. I think uh, a lot of Indigenous people have been, you know, sending out this message um, all across this country for, for generations. People, Indigenous people have been, you know, trying to, you know, voice all, so many of these concerns. I, I'm hopeful that Canadians will hear, you know, um, the strength of all of these Indigenous voices and, and uh, the future of Canada would be brighter if Canadians included Indigenous people. Is your art a part of reconciliation? My art is not about reconciliation. I think my art is about communication. Reconciliation has to come from Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm, I'm messaging about truth. Um, I'm trying to communicate um, real histories. Um, it's not my job to, to do any reconciling. That's for Canadians to, mm -hmm. to, to consider. 
If people were to take one thing from your work and exhibit, what would you want it to be? I would want um, the audience to educate themselves. You know, if they're seeing these images and they're moved by them. I would want them to uh, take it a step further. Mm -hmm. And like I said, to read the report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That's a good starting point because residential schools were such a, um, a devastating and important part of indigenous uh, uh, lives and you know, shattered families and disrupted our communities. And it's, it continues to affect um, our families. So I, I, I would want Canadians to, to really learn more. And, and once people learn more, um, you know, they're in a better position to, to make the right choices. Do you think now with uh, social media, this is an opportune time for everybody to learn more and for people who are, we might not hear from generally to have their say? Yeah, I think the, the real turning point happened with the digital revolution mm -hmm. in that, you know, all of a sudden all these communities that would have otherwise been shut out mm -hmm. got access to media. And um, now with social media, um, that's exactly what's happening. Indigenous voices don't need to be heard, or they don't need the mainstream platforms to be heard, because mm -hmm. through social media, the message goes so widely, so quickly. Um, you know, when I post, I, I posted the scream on, on Facebook, and, and that thing went viral in about a week and a half. It had 300,000 views. And that was about a week before the exhibition opened, so I knew mm -hmm. that um, something about that image was really speaking to people, but it was the social media that really moved that image across the country very quickly. And not, not just the country, but, you know, North America. Kent, it's been so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having it's me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.